Okay, good morning everyone. Um, you'll notice I'll be doing the two glasses trick this morning. That's where being online helps, just having to wear one set of glasses. Um, so, uh, good morning and welcome to City of Glasgow College Learning and Teaching Conference. My name is Claire Carney and I'm the Vice Principal of Student Experience here at the College. I'm very pleased to see so many of you here, both in person and online, and we have delegates joining us from within, both, from both within the college, um, but also from sectoral agencies, colleges and universities from across Scotland and beyond, including Finland. So welcome. As you'll see, we have a packed agenda. Um, so before we begin, just some housekeeping information for you all. There are no fire drills planned, so if you hear the alarm, please um, go to the nearest exit and staff will direct you throughout. Restrooms are located on the ground floor through the coffee shop or on floor two, just opposite the main staircase. To access Wi-Fi, those of you who need it, details are posted at the registration desk. And finally, you should all have a copy of the conference programme as it was emailed to you yesterday. Um, or alternatively, and in addition, you can download it using the QR code on the flyer issued at the event registration. So to begin, um, I make no apologies for saying that our business is education. And this conference gives all of us the time to celebrate the breadth and excellent practice and innovation here and from across the sector in what has been yet another turbulent, tiring and challenging year. One year I will not say that, maybe year four I won't say that. So during this time we have remained committed and focused on our purpose, which is to let learning flourish. And you will see that the presentations being offered today demonstrate our continual drive to enhancing what we do. As we all know, these events are as much about meeting up with colleagues, and I hope you'll use the day to find out about and share the practice from within your own areas and across subjects. And of course, to have a good old gossip and to find out what's really happening in that area over there. So today's conference theme is about transforming tertiary educa education. And the aim of which is to take a pause and consider where we are in transforming what and how we deliver in an ever-changing and uncertain world. Are we preparing our students for that uncertainty? To deal with ambiguity, I can never say that word, <laughs> practice so much, to deal with ambiguity, to question and navigate information and misinformation, to work with and respect those who do not look like us or sound like us and to navigate the world of work and present the skills and attributes they've developed while studying at the college. Remember last year, Julie Salmon asked the audience, are we reverters, i.e. go back to the way it was before COVID, or are we transformers, forever looking to change and adapt to a future-facing world? And upwards of 80% of the audience at that time said they were transformers. So have a think, what would be the answer now? And indeed, it might be useful to ask that question of ourselves at the end of the keynote speech today, and again, at the end of today. I suspect that the majority of people in this room and online are transformers. Looking internally at our own way of doing things, the student academic experience strategy is pivotal to our future direction. The strategy has been deliberately designed to lead from the future and is simply framed around the city student, city learning and teaching and the city student journey. It is about who we teach, what we teach and how we teach and our delivery model centred around being active, blended and connected. Many of the topics presented and discussed today are part of that strategy, including work completed on the city student, which is the identification of those attributes or skills that are beyond the vocational and academic qualification. This work has been led by Dean Alison Bell, oh, Alison, and a soft launch of those attributes will be shared at one of the electives. They are captured around the City of Glasgow College acronym, C-O-G-C and stand for curious about how the world works and a willingness to progress and continue to learn. 
optimistic and open to change and opportunities. Globally aware and mindful of their position and responsibility to the planet and aligned with the UN Sustainability Development Goals and a contributor who can connect and collaborate and is self-motivated. You can hear more at that session and no doubt there will be more to come following the conference. A further aspect of the strategy is developing our portfolio and we're all in the depths of that and particularly my credentials which will be a key component of our portfolio and we are incredibly lucky to have a lead expert in the college, Dean Siobhan Wilson. Now Siobhan was due to run a workshop for us today but unfortunately can't be with us but she will run a, another session for us um, in the near future. We also need to look outside and consider how we fit into the fabric of tertiary education sector. What can this college and others do to secure that future and evolve the offering to meet employers and students' expectations or demands? This work is all part of our transformative approach and whilst this conference is a key event in our learning and teaching diary, it is part of a raft of events across all faculties this week, supported by the Learning Teaching Academy, focusing on curricular design to support changes to the structure of the academic year, but also key elements of blended learning and maximising our use of Canvas. Ultimately, we are seeking to enhance and continually improve what and how we do things, and a key partner in that, of course, is our students. Students are at the centre physically and metaphorically of all of what we do and our genuine partnership with City Student Association and the College is fundamental to understanding our students and the student experience. Key outcomes from that close partnership work this year has been the identification of key themes centred around effective communication, assessment burden and mindful timetabling and more of that to come into next year. So I'm delighted to share the stage with Megan McClellan, uh, who's our student president, and Megan would like to say some words of welcome. Thanks, Megan. Um, thank you, Claire, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm terrible and very much hate public speaking, uh, but I also hate saying no, so this is probably a very good lesson to me and learning to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the current student president and last year was our VP of Learning and Teaching. For those of you who do know me, yes, that means I have served my two years and you will be getting rid of me in about 12 weeks time. As Claire mentioned, this is a challenging and uncertain time for both students and staff across the sector. But with that challenge and uncertainty also comes an opportunity to transform our system into something more dynamic and impactful. I've been very lucky over the past few years to be involved and included in various conversations regarding the future of the sector from NUS, SQA, Sparks, to even conversations within our own college. While there's still quite a bit of uncertainty um, of what the next few years look like, I do feel very reassured that the student experience, especially here at the college, is truly at the core of our decision making. After a few unconventional years of teaching, it's been exciting to see what dynamic changes can be made even under difficult circumstances and the resilience and eagerness of our students, and even though they shouldn't have to be resilient. I've been very proud of the work we've done as a Students Association to ensure that these positive changes were we were forced to make through a pandemic, such as mindful timetabling, blended learning approaches, are ones that we continue to adapt and perfect instead of reverting back to what we once considered normal. As a Students Association, we're aware of the challenges that face staff and students going forward and the time and effort that it takes to make these transformations and achieve what we're looking for. Um, but we're also aware that our partnerships with staff are integral to ensuring that these changes are made effectively for everyone. In recent years, our Student Association and our partnerships have continued to flourish and the student voice has made a very big impact on our transformations as a college and the next few years, especially with the development of Metaskills. We'll continue to see the value and impact of our partnerships transform as well. Those of you who do know me will be very much aware that the effect of communication has been a sticking point for me over the last few years. I believe that cooperative communications between staff and students make a massive difference to the overall student experience. And that's on every level from representation systems to just replying to each other. Um, 
our representation systems are a massive part of bridging the gap between staff and students, allowing students to promote positive solutions and support the college to adapt solutions that support both staff and lecturers and support staff. If you hadn't already guessed it, that is what we will be speaking about in our elective session. Uh, so I hope, or maybe don't hope, to see some of you there. Um, as Claire mentioned, today is going to be filled with a lot of vibrant and innovative speakers who will be much better than I am. Uh, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time uh, because I hate this. So <laughs> <laughs> I will move back to Claire so that we can get started with today. Thank you, Megan. And I think she's brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, Megan, you're natural at this. <laughs> so, fantastic. All right. So, moving on a little bit, um, a key project we worked on last year with the Student Association and one of significant uh, importance to everyone in this room and across the whole education sector um, is ac academic integrity. I'm struggling with my words already. That usually just happens about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so, we were really particularly interested in academic integrity and the explosion of essay mills or contract cheating. I felt I was in a, in a vacuum for a while where people are looking at me going, that's not an issue for us here. And actually a key message from last year's conference was, if you think it is not happening in your area, then think again. And I think we all know uh, this is here now and has been pretty much trumped by artificial intelligence in education, which is potentially the biggest disruption to modern education. And a key question for all of us is, do we regulate or embrace? So we are privileged to have a leading expert in the field and it gives me great pleasure to welcome award-winning speaker, author, investor, podcaster and blogger, Donald Clark. Um, with over three decades experience in online learning, video games, simulations, semantic, adaptive, social media, mobile learning, virtual reality, AI and metaverse projects. I understood some of that. Uh, Donald has designed, delivered and advised on online learning for many global, public and private organisations. Donald is also a multiple award winner, including the first Outstanding Achievement in E-Learning Award and Best Online Learning Project and a JISC EdTech Award, amongst lots of others. Donald has written books on AI and education, learning experience design and learning technology, available in all good bookshops and in very good libraries, including our own. These are topics that are very relevant to all of us today, where we consider the mix of online and in-person teaching and the current hype and in some places panic about the role of AI in education. So we're privileged to have Donald with us. I didn't put in that list of tributes, Donald, that you're also Scottish. <laughs> so at least one person on the panel today <laughs> is Scottish. So um, thank you, Donald, and if you'd like to join us. Good morning. I am indeed Scottish, although I haven't been, I haven't lived here for 38 years. I actually live in Brighton, which is as far away from Scotland as you can get without getting wet. <laughs> uh, and it's really nice to be back in Glasgow. Uh, Joe, my host last night, took me out to the Sloan Bar. It was really great to be back here. Uh, 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 that was lovely. In fact, the last time I, I gave a talk in Glasgow was one of those TED Talks. And the people were really officious. You had to stand in a wee, uh, you know, white tape thing and uh, you weren't allowed to use many slides. And I remember the last line the girl said to me, she said, and whatever you do, don't swear. And <laughs> for the whole of the talk, I kept, swear words kept coming back. I'm in Glasgow, for God's sake, you know. Uh, uh, they kept coming in. I managed to avoid the trap. Anyway, one of the reasons I'm really glad to be invited here to Glasgow College is for much of my lifetime, I have been building companies, been involved in all that sort of entrepreneurial stuff. However, I've also been involved as a director of sitting guilds, learned direct, I've sponsored grassroots football teams, and that was the world I came from. I was, I, I think Glasgow have got some grants from a thing called the University for Industry, UFI. So I set that charity up, and that was 60 million just for technology projects, just in vocational learning. And it's a subject that's close to my heart. 
So I'm not here just to sort of throw out this blue sky AI stuff. I really believe that this technology really matters in your sector. I've spent all my adult life actually being annoyed at how higher education has actually ripped funding out of this sector. Uh, we're, we're actually suffering the consequences of that now. Uh, you know, during COVID, all these people who were practical jobs kept us alive. <laughs> Basically, everybody sitting there on Zoom thinking they ruled the, and run the world. Uh, in practice, 80% uh, of the world's population actually don't work at home and don't work in offices. And uh, I think we sometimes forget that. So I'm going to be talking about AI today. I don't want to frighten you with this in any sense, but something very, very profound has happened. But to be honest, we've been in this world for a long time. You live in the world of AI. And if you're a teacher, you certainly live in the world of AI. If you haven't used Google, then really? <laughs> I doubt it. If you haven't used Google Scholar as an academic in research, then I doubt it. I think you must be lying. If you use social media, everything, all your timelines are mediated by AI. If, like me, you watched endless amounts of Netflix and Prime during COVID, that interface is mediated by AI. Almost everything you do online is mediated by AI. The reason you don't get porn and dick pics on your social media is AI is protecting you from it. <laughs> it protects your bank accounts. It protects your health data. So you live in the world of AI. It's just invisible. Good technology is invisible, actually. It's an important point. Donald Norman made this point, the great guru in design. It's terribly important. But it will change. Not only will it change the workplace, and because it changes the workplace, it will also change, as Claire said, why we learn, what we learn, and it will certainly change how we learn. And a very interesting event happened on November the 30th, and I had arranged to give all these talks before this on AI, and it was quite hard work. But my life has been made easy because on November the 30th, OpenAI launched ChatGPT. Okay? Within five days, a million people had used it. Within two months, a hundred million people had used it. And it's going through the roof. And it's going through the roof because those hundred million people had a look at this thing and it blew their minds. It blew their minds because it was quite sophisticated. It was very visible. It was in your lap all of a sudden. Now, five days later, something else happened. Anybody know? It was my birthday, December the 5th. Anybody in the audience know what happened on December the 5th? There's another piece of technology announced. No? Nobody? Okay. Well, on December the 5th in California, they lit the fuse on fusion. For the first time in the history of our species, we took a bit of the actually hydrogen atoms, and we managed to create more energy than we put in. I don't know why we didn't have a ticker tape, uh, tape parade for this, because all of this AI stuff, all these lights in here, there's no doubt we have a climate emergency, we have an energy crisis, and for the first time in my lifetime, that promise of fusion is there. So the experts in that field think this is heading towards commercial use in about 2040s sometime. This is good news for climate change. And yet how, nobody knows about it. It's like all my adult life I've seen this happen. Technology gets launched, it's profound, and we sort of ignore it until it comes along. And then we love it, and then we forget about it and demote it again. But AI is not going away. This is probably as profound a moment as you can imagine in terms of learning technology. The, this launch, these large language models. So I wrote this, wrote this book in 2020, artificial intelligence, and that's what we're going to take a deep dive into today. Another book I wrote was on learning technology. And have a look at this here, because I think we forget sometimes that technology is just integral to teaching and always has been. Writing is a technology, invented only four times in the history of our species, uh, about 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and Egypt, uh, also in uh, South America, also in China. And writing is still, in fact, I think we have too much writing, I think, you know, you know, if young people are going to continue spending 20 solid years of their life writing essays, I really wonder what the purpose of education is. Uh, I think we're drowning in a sea of text, which is why I think this whole academic integrity around chat GTP is a bit of a sideshow, to be honest. We're going to have to cope with it. So we had writing 5,000 years ago. Moving on, we had printing, which suddenly 
gave, of course, the wonders of knowledge to learners themselves. Before that, it was largely in Latin, owned by the state or monarchs. That was uh, the Reformation gave us that, really, in mainland Europe, spread around the world. About 50 years ago, we have computers, another big bang, and the internet, of course. And there isn't a learner on the planet with access, online access, who doesn't use the internet every single day when they're learning. Every single day, if not every five minutes. And then suddenly, five years ago, AI exploded, but it's now really exploded. Really exploded, and it's not going away. But a couple of warnings here. Just if I'm a teacher and I look at AI, the first thing you have to remember is, I use this phrase, it's an idiot savant. What do I mean by that? Well, it's really, really good at very precise things. It's not very good at being a generalist, like a teacher. It's not a human being. It's not a human being. It doesn't have that flexibility, that sensibility, that common sense that a good teacher has, okay? And I'll give you an example of this. So I have a Roomba in my home in Brighton, and it comes out and it does the whole of the bottom floor of my house. And it has a brain, and it has an AI brain. And when it comes to the end of the step, it reverses. When it runs out of juice, it goes back and plugs itself in. It's a fantastic device. It's like your dishwasher. I, you know, I, I grew up in a house without a dishwasher, you know, when I was younger. But we don't think twice about that being a marvelous piece of technology. But I also have a dog. That's my dog. <laughs> my friend John Helmer says this is the most Scottish-looking dog he's ever seen in his life. <laughs> and of course, my dog, when it comes out and does his business on the carpet, my Roomba, remember what I said, it's precise but brilliant, will come out and spread it mathematically, because it's mapped out my house into every corner, because it doesn't know shit, it doesn't know anything. <laughs> a second point about AI is just remember this when you're trying to say, oh, it's racist, it's not. <laughs> this is just a competent thing, it's just software. Okay, the guy who invented the phrase artificial intelligence, John McCarthy, uh, uh, in the States in 1956, regretted actually coming up with the term, because it's got that sort of anthropomorphic word, word intelligence in it, so we're always benchmarking it against humans. In actual fact, it is just software, okay? So remember that. It's not, <laughs> it has no consciousness. It has no moral opinion in the world. Uh, it's important that we realize from that when we critique the thing. And of course, all learners use AI. I just give you many, many examples there. These are my kids when they were two years old. I have twin boys, okay, before school, happy as larks. This is them a few years later, a couple of shiny things. It's really expensive having twins. You have to buy two things every time. Uh, this is them uh, when they get uh, a little bit older here. I can't remember what age they are. A couple of laptops, old Dells. Then it was the Macs. Then we move into the mobile phone age. It's getting really expensive. Uh, this is them uh, tablet time. Remember when they came in for the first time? And then finally, of course, they actually do most of their stuff here now. Now, they refuse point blank to allow me to take any photographs after that age. They're now 29. <laughs> One of them left school at 18, is involved in tech, you know, never went, never went to college, nothing, now employs graduates. The other one did take that academic route, degree in artificial intelligence, that maths kid, you know, but that's important. You know, there has to be this spread of options for kids these days. This expectation that everybody goes to university in this graduate class that takes everything and we reward just people who do knowledge work. People who work with their heart in social care and health care or work with their hands or, you know, I've seen it out there and down there somewhere. This happened in my lifetime. It's massively disappointed me. There are many, many options in life and I think those options are coming back. So, artificial, let's take this dive into learning. The first thing about human beings are I've taught, so I've taught at various levels. I've taught maths at secondary school level, right up to postdoc in universities, and Ivy League universities in the States and so on. And the one thing you all know as teachers is this damn thing here is a bit of a nuisance. <laughs> if you're trying to teach somebody, it takes about 20 years to educate somebody before they're sort of reasonably competent to go into the workplace, 20 solid years. It forgets almost everything you try and teach it, everything mainly because learning is fixated with events. Learning is actually a process. It's not an event. And what we've done is invented pedagogies that are primarily events, namely lectures. So I'm talking you to, I'm here for an hour today, you're going to forget almost everything I'm going to tell you. Almost everything. That's science, folks. Ebbinghaus, 1885. 
another 130 years, replicated studies, you're going to forget everything unless you take some notes. We're inattentive, we suffer massively from cognitive overload, so my working memory here, I can only remember about three things at one time to manipulate them. So if I give you three or four numbers, say what's 27 plus 16 plus 14 plus 15 plus 6, <laughs> you're lost. Uh, working memory is an incredibly limited thing and the enemy of teaching, of course. That's why we sometimes go too fast. When I was uh, teaching maths, I just went too fast, you know. I did, did, took, it, took it too quickly and uh, we sometimes forget that. Of course, the brain gets massively demotivated. Uh, we have uh, about 50 biases. Daniel Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for discovering those. And if you've, I don't know if you've read the book Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a terribly written book. Nobody ever gets to the end of that book, I don't think. But the penultimate page has the most important word in it. And he says, all these biases you have, we're all sexist, we're all racist. We're all these statistical biases around race, negativity bias, confirmation bias. You can't, he says, they're uneducable. Interesting word. In other words, you can't get rid of them. <laughs> you can suppress them, but you can't get rid of them. The interesting thing about AI is we have, a lot, of course, other things about the brain here. We sleep eight hours a day. I can't network something from your brain to mine. We can't communally network. We have to talk to each other. It's quite a painful process. We use these big meat fingers through typewriter, uh, through keyboards. And of course, we die. <laughs> we die. Men 10 years younger than women. And that's not true of AI. It's not true of technology. Writing, books, printing, the internet the stuff we leave behind, the stuff we've created, videos on YouTube and so on. It's free, and it can be, it's not wholly free from bias, mathematical bias being different from human bias, but it doesn't die, and it scales. ChatGPT reached, and is reaching, hundreds of millions of people, and it's free. Google is free, Google Scholar is free, Duolingo is free. And you regard it as the enemy in education. Since when was something that's free that helps people learn the enemy? I can remember when Wikipedia was launched and universities actually blocked it. They actually blocked it. How crazy can you be? Uh, the biggest, one of the biggest achievements in our species, that capturing of knowledge. And who doesn't go to Wikipedia now and again to look things up these days? So, to get practical for a moment, I'm going to run through some things that you know, we as teachers could possibly use this stuff for. And of course, the first one is AI is a new UI. I've already mentioned that almost every interface you use is AI driven. And of course, this started with Google about 20 years ago. And that little Bayesian equation up here, if anybody teaches maths will recognize this, that founded one of the biggest companies on the planet, that little thing that you could write on the back of your hand there. And of course, there are other things as well. If you've been involved in accessibility stuff, then, and there are some experts here, Wendy's here, the Scottish company called Ecom, who are as good as anybody in the UK or Europe on accessibility and learning. If you want to know anything about that, ask those people that are here today. But of course, we have all this whole thing about speech. So we did evolve to speak to each other, <laughs> you know, not to write books or read books, which is why reading and writing takes so long in school. It's a sort of secondary skill, not a primary skill that we're almost born with. We pick up our first language and we, we can hear and, uh, and expect you to have another mind instinctively. But we also have these things like Alexa in our house. The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is go, Alexa, news. I'm not even out of my bed. And it gives me the news, and if I want to drill down at one topic, that's what I do. Okay. And during the day, if I'm cooking or whatever, I use it for timers. If I'm going on a Zoom call, I use it as an alarm. It's like having an assistant in my own home. And then comes, along comes this, chat GPT. And this is profound because it changes our relationship with knowledge. We had writing. The, the, the expression of ideas, the archiving of human ideas in print. We had publishing. We had the internet that actually added other media. So we had YouTube with video, with podcasts, with audio. We have lots of graphics and images. We have text. All those media became available. Now our relationship with knowledge is changing because we're sort of going back to dialogue. The important four letters in this word here are C-H-A-T. I'm tired of seeing things on Twitter where people ask it a question and it comes up with a reply they don't like. No, that's not what this is about. It's about continuing to ask it questions. And it's a bit like speaking to an alien chat GPT if you've tried it, you know. 
It's a bit like you know, somebody from some other planet's just knocked on your front door. And it speaks very good English, but there's something a bit weird about it. But that's because it's just, as I said at the beginning, a bit of a dumb brute. Okay, it's just a probability engine sp spitting out words. But once you get to know it, and once you keep asking it questions, it gets really good really quickly and starts to really blow your mind. And I'll show you some examples as we go through here. So I typed in here, I don't know if you can read that, Glasgow College, what's great about the college? And you know, a wide range of courses, industry relevant training, excellent facilities, experience faculty, student support's really good, blah, blah, blah. You know, it did that. How did it do that? How did it know about Glasgow College? Okay, well, it has 170 five billion parameters, and a parameter is just the relationship between two words, it's just a statistical weighting. But it spits out all of this perfect English in a very structured fashion, and it's almost a perfect summary. That's what's blowing people's minds. Now, if we go through the learning journey for a minute, I'll go move on to the next one. So we've already got search, we've already got a radical change in interfaces for learners and teachers. What about learner engagement? Well, let me give you another example, and that's Duolingo, which is free, has 37 million active users. That's six times the whole of the population in Scotland, babes and pensioners and all. Okay, I have a friend, two friends actually, one whose girlfriend is Dutch, who's been on a streak of 500 days and is speaking good conversational Dutch, another who's doing Spanish similarly. This is the way this would go, and we'll come to this later because this, there's more under the hood in this than you might imagine. I was involved with a company in Derry in Northern Ireland called Learning Pool. And again, we spent a lot of time injecting AI. This is workplace learning, not education. Injecting AI into their systems. And one of the things we did is introduce the social intelligence dashboard. And it was AI isn't just about, you know, that's a whole cheating and exams thing, which is a sideshow, I think. We actually used it to identify, and this is quite common in some systems, although you have to be careful about the data issues, to identify in the social data whether the learners are liking the course, what they're finding difficult in the course. Are they going to fail? Are we trying to predict how many of those students are likely to drop out, so on and so forth? In other words, you can actually tell how people feel using AI because the language they express betrays their feelings. So it's getting quite sophisticated. Another project I've been heavily involved in is a company called Glean, based in Leeds. Now, when students sit, as you're doing now, and you're talking to them, giving a lecture or whatever, they'll be taking notes. And in the first year, they write everything verbatim. By the second year, it's down to a couple of words. Uh, by the end of the second year, about 40% of them are not turning up at all. <laughs> this is true. That figure, actually, is a mean across globally. 40% of students, even at Harvard, don't turn up for lectures. That's a shocking figure. You know, imagine running a restaurant, everybody's paid for the meal, 40% don't turn up. We think the food's good? Maybe not. Maybe not, you know? So the first big revolution really in pedagogy was this recording of lectures. And that's a bit like the early days of film where you just filmed the theater, you know, and then we showed the play. Uh, but it, uh, if you're not recording lectures, wow, you know, what are you doing? You know, if I wrote a novel and I said, I'm only gonna read it out to you once. I'm not gonna put it in a book. I'm not gonna publish it. Better listen, better take notes. Or if I was a journalist, so Megan, it's finished our course in journalism. Imagine Megan said, I've written this piece, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to put it in a newspaper or online. You've got to listen, take notes. You go, are you crazy? Are you mad? And of course, everything, everything in the psychology of learning points towards learners needing two or three bites to the cherry, retrieval practice, that whole transfer, cognitive overload thing. All of that points towards giving students recorded stuff so that they can revise, they can get it from short to long-term memory, they can reflect and think and do all the critical thinking that you want them to do. Now, what we've done with AI here is recognize that students are not very good note takers, and we take the transcript of the lecture, we compare it to the student notes, and we don't take the note taking away from them because that's a generative learning act. Uh, Mellon Whitrock, the whole theory behind that, that's a terribly important thing that they're writing those notes. But we do spot if we miss something, and we put the headings in automatically, and we summarize stuff for them. Or if they don't know the meaning of a word, it will pop it automatically into their notes. This is the way this stuff is helping learners. It's not the enemy of learning. It actually makes learning super efficient. So what about learner analysis? Well, out there in workplace learning, this is happening, I think it's happening much more rapidly than in education, but you know, that, that's natural. I'm, I'm not critical of education because of this. 
Uh, we have now very large companies doing skill building, trying to predict what the skills they will need in four or five years will be. And of course, they're pointing the whole of their learning and development department towards those skill sets. That makes sense. That's what will grow the company. Uh, another project I was heavily involved in last year for a big European company was a thing called the Blender. I really do think you should hang your hat on this phrase, blended learning. And blended learning, not blended teaching. <laughs> Almost every example I see of blended teaching at conferences, uh, blended learning is actually blended teaching. Oh yeah, we'll have a little bit of the classroom, we'll have some of this online stuff, we'll slam it together with Velcro and we'll hope for the best. That's not blended learning. Blended learning is going back to scratch and redesigning your course and optimizing the output. So we have this tool, and I don't think you can do that in your head. I think templates and things like Canvas and so on work pretty well. It's a good halfway house, but it's got so complicated now that even that is starting to be difficult. So this takes all the data about learners, okay? Uh, you know, do the uh, you know, typical stuff about learners, gender mix, educational background, attainment, so on and so forth, diversity. Then all the stuff about learning, that's the really important data. You know, what type of course is this? What, is, it, is it a sort of more knowledge-based, a more practical course? And then all the resources, do they actually have good enough smartphones and laptops to do the online stuff and so forth? We put it in as an input, and then we have this incredibly smart piece of mathematics, essentially AI in the middle, that spits out an optimized blend. I think every college should be doing this. And it stops us making the mistakes as individual teaching teachers is imagining we know all the variables and we can hold them all in our head and magically come up with the optimized blend because we can't we're doing it on the back of an envelope folks and it's time we moved on and started using technology to do that task and of course this whole data I constantly say this you're not going to move forward in this world without taking the word data very very seriously and not just descriptive data you know did the learner when did the learner did they pass did they complete this course what score did they get in the exam that's you know that's just descriptive data it's the analysis of the data using that data to predict things going forward to use that data to automate processes to make things easier for the student as in the note-taking example i gave so fourth one learner support i think this is probably one of the most important because a lot of students struggle it affects their mental health, and they struggle because they get lost, they're confused, they get demotivated, and I think we're duty-bound to help them. And this is an example that goes back to 2018, 1718, I think, Georgia Tech in the US, 450 students, smart kids, they're all doing an AI course, all the maths is pretty hot, but when you give them an assignment, faculty were flooded with emails. If you've ever taught in the technical area, you know this is true. You give them the same, well, what library in Python do I use? What grant? Blah, blah, blah. Hundreds and hundreds of technical questions you get if you've not specified it clearly enough. In actual fact, they had uh, over four years, they had about 10,000 of these queries every year. To answer them, they worked out would be four years of solid work for a teacher. So clearly, if your concern is workload, then this is a way you can take the workload off the shoulders of a teacher by allowing all that stuff, all that admin, admin to be automated. Okay? And they had nine teaching assistants. They swapped one out for a bot. That's a chat bot, chat GTP thing. They wrote it themselves and the students put it up for a teaching award. They put it, how weird is that? <laughs> They put it up for a teaching award. Not only that, when you ask the students, they actually had to slow it down. So it spat back the answer so quickly, so consistently, that it, they, the, the students, they're AI kids, you know, they're going, well, that's a bit fast. So they slowed it down to look as though a human being was typing it. <laughs> to make it look more dumb like us. So next year, it's interesting, all the students knew, of course, that this bot thing was when they go. They launched two others called Ian and Stacy. Only 50% of the students identify Stacy as AI. Uh, and only 16. Some thought that the second, some thought that real teachers were the bots, because <laughs> the teachers had upped their game by then, of course. So you have this weird mixture, and this is what will happen. This new relationship with this technology is one of dialogue. You know, we had just teachers and learners. We now have teachers, learners. We also have bits of software that learn. The word learning, reinforcement learning, deep learning. That's what AI is. We also have bits of software that teach. So there's four new kids on the block of teachers as technology and learners as technology. 
And this is a perfect example of that. This is a really interesting example that I followed in some detail, and that was a teacher in the States who was teaching a cybersecurity course. And one of the problems with IT sometimes when you're teaching it is the basic vocabulary is lost in some people. You may have an audience that's come from industry, students, a big mixture of people, and the basic vocabulary, it's often true in medical training, you know, a nurse's vocabulary might be different from a medical student who's been through for six years or whatever. And the, the student feedback was amazing. This teacher actually got all the students in the class to sign up for ChatGTP and use it as he was teaching that module on cybersecurity. And the kids loved it. Why did they like it? Because if they had a problem, like what, what's offset in the binary file or what's an embedded resource in malware, they could just ask that question and within five to 10 seconds, it gave them an answer. You can't actually do that on YouTube, and sorry, on Google, because it goes off to a link, you go to the link, it takes, it takes forever. This thing sort of marbles the fat into the meat of the teaching and learning process. It's a very positive way of using this type of technology with learners. And this is student feedback, you know, response to game changing. They just loved it. Another paper, notes the date here, March the 2nd, so this is pretty contemporary stuff at MIT. They've been doing some interesting studies on the use of chat GTP in the workplace as a productivity tool in writing tasks very specifically. And this is the first big paper in this area. A sample of about 400 now, that's fine. And what did they find? Okay, not only did it raise the productivity, when, and by productivity they meant two things here, the time taken to produce a good piece of prose, uh, that decreases by a 0.8 standard deviation, which is pretty good, very good in fact, and the output quality rises by 0.4, that's sort of moderate statistically. Uh, and the interesting thing they found was that actually the people who are writing the text using this thing almost as a partner or an aid they found that the ideas generation was much richer. In other words, it doesn't stop you from doing things. It actually gets the juices flowing and makes you write and think better. This is why it's important in learning as well, because I think it encourages students to think more, which is the aim of teaching and learning. So that's learner support. I think that will happen. I've been involved in lots of projects like that. It, it's going to happen, folks. In fact, students are doing it themselves anyway. They'll be using ChatGTP, whether you like it or not in that context. What about learning delivery? So I used to run a big e-learning company, the first big one in the UK, floated it in the stock market, blah, blah, blah. I made a lot of money from that. And I feel a bit guilty now because actually AI can do it much quicker. Even now, if you go to a big e-learning company and ask them to do an hour's worth of e-learning, they'll charge you 10 to 20,000 pounds for one hour. And it will be cartoons and multiple choice questions. The little speech bubbles. <laughs> what did Peter think about the Data Protection Act? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Actually, the sort of learning delivery that you can do now, so I've been involved in loads of projects in this area, but this one takes, you know, every organization, every educational institution has this huge mother load of PowerPoints, documents, videos. What do you do? It's, how do you get that in the heads of students? Okay, well, one of the ways is to take that and put it through AI to automatically produce content. So this is a project before COVID for TUI, biggest hospitality company in Europe. And they had a problem, which was all these young kids had been out in Ayanapa and Ibiza, all those reps, re I really love those kids. They're really super, th these kids, you know, age 19 and 20 were dealing with serious problems, you know, out in these places, you know, things like rape and it, it was horrendous. Some of them, you know, mature beyond their years, really good communicators. When they brought them back to the country and came up the management scale and they had to work in travel agents and do other things, they found they didn't have any basic knowledge, a classic apprenticeship problem. Well, you knew how to do some of these things, but you don't really have the core knowledge underneath to do it all. So we did all that and we used the AI to produce the content in just a few weeks. All the competitors said it would take months. It saved them 438,000 pounds. That was just an apprenticeship program across the whole of Europe. It was so popular so good that they spread it out through, throughout the whole business. And then they did something quite interesting. Does this training really work? And they tracked. So all these kids suddenly had to sell cruises to people my age, you know? <laughs> suddenly people are going to the Caribbean, you know, the Mediterranean, uh, all, all those old people have stolen all the money. But the problem is those kids, you know, going on a Mediterranean cruise, they, they had never been to Venice or they had never been to Naples, let's say. 
But they had to know that it was the home of pizza, Vesuvius was there, you can go and see Pompeii. So they had to get that knowledge in their heads, because travel agents, as you know, will always lie to you and say, oh, it's great there, I've been there. They've never been there. Uh, but they know two or three great things about the place, that's how you sell. And we tracked the sales data versus the training, and it was a massive correlation between whether they had done the Mediterranean cruise training thing, the geography, and the sales. And it led to a massive increase in sales there. So you know, for, it's really interesting, the impact this stuff. And that's all AI-based training, screenshot from there. And we've done loads of stuff and, you know, quite heavyweight engineering stuff as well for the guys who go out. Uh, they're mostly guys, I should, I should I go out to the aircraft and spot any mistakes. And then they have a ticket system and it goes into the hangar to get repaired and so on. All that software was all taught using an AI-generated program. And it's, I think, superior to current e-learning because it does something quite clever. When you're in a classroom and you ask a question, I doubt if many teachers say, ask multiple choice questions. <laughs> do you ever say, is it A, B? You might do it occasionally, but it's pretty weird if you did that all the time. But that's what e-learning does because the software's constricted. AI allows you to ask open questions. Okay, so you just type in what you want. And it uses incredibly smart mathematics to recognize the semantic meaning of the answers. So you really can put students not to the test. It's a learning experience. Uh, you can really do wonderful things with this stuff. Uh, if you're interested, I've written a, a, a whole hundred of these prompts. You know, how, how are you going to use this chat GTP as a teacher or a learner to get the best out of it? I'm more than willing to just uh, I'll distribute it. Anybody can have a copy of that. But the sort of things you can use chat GTP for are sort of get some rules about general prompting. And I would use it as a, iteratively as a form of dialogue, chat with it. Don't just ask a question and wait on a block of text coming up. So I've got some advice on you on how to do that initially. You can use it to design courses, and many people are. The whole what are the learning objectives, syllabus, curricular design, and so on. And it's pretty good, guys, for some topics, not everything. You can create content using it, of course. And right down here, right down to voice and style. The voice and style one I love. So you can say, right, I want you to write this bit of text, but assume the audience is a 14-year-old. <laughs> okay, you can say, I want you to speak like a pirate, and it will speak like a pirate if you want. <laughs> I had a burn supper and I wrote the address to the haggis and I, I got, went into GTP and said I want an address to the haggis in the style of Trump <laughs> and the haggis was pretty good <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, that's the sort of wonderful stuff you can do with that but let's not go into too much detail there another thing you can do with AI and this is why it's been around for a long time in the accessibility area so that has been revolutionised text to speech, speech to text if you're blind or deaf that will be your life it's a game changer. And when the smartphone came along and Whisper is free, the best piece of voice recognition software on the planet, and it's free out of open AI. And criticize Elon Musk all you want, but he was the guy who put the first billion into this. And it's a not-for-profit. It's actually a cat not-for-profit, but that's what it is. It will also create images. People think it's about creating text. It's moved way beyond that now with Dial D first, which came out of Chat GTP. This photograph won a photography award. Some smart aleck actually put it in, generated by AI, purely and utterly. It's a startling image, but there's nothing human about this issue, this image here. And uh, you'll see that increasingly happening. It'll be difficult to distinguish between AI produced content and human content because it's getting very, very good indeed. And of course, we've got video as well. You can already go to Synthesia and other companies like this. I don't like the talking head that stuff that much, to be honest. I mean, I don't, you know, when you sit down in an evening and watch Netflix, it's not just constant talking heads that would drive you bananas. Uh, actually, on the math software I've been involved in, we get rid of talking heads altogether because it's just cognitive noise. Who needs to see this face when they're learning maths? Really, it adds nothing cognitively, which is why Khan Academy got rid, you never see Khan, you just hear his voice and you see the colour blackboard thing coming up. On Duolingo, you don't see Louis Van Aan or any faces. <laughs> It'd be stupid. When you go to Google, you don't expect a little learning assistant to pop up a little face at the top and give you an answer. It didn't make any sense. That's why I think these robot teacher ideas are stupid. A, a robot teacher is a bit like buying a Tesla or a, you know, a, a fully automated car and then buying a robot driver to drive it. It makes no sense. All this stuff's online. You want to get rid of the face. Some things matter, 
I think in teaching, like little bits of video at the beginning that sort of identify who the person is. You know, I'm a practicing plumber, whatever, you know, nautical engineer, blah, blah, blah. I think that matters, but don't overdo it. We overdo the talking head. Get rid of it as soon as possible. You know, you don't see David Attenborough's face throughout the whole documentary. You, when you cut to those scenes of the whales beaching, you don't see his face up in the corner of the screen. And yet all the software we have for lecture cap, there always has the academic stuck postcard like completely ignoring all the rules of good television and film personalization now this i love because i think this is truly revolutionary if you're teaching i'll stick to the maths that's the one I, I know best maths and language learning are two areas of catastrophic failure in schools you know every single kid in scotland will be taught what french german spanish italian whatever and they'll barely be able to order a cup of coffee when they go to any one of those countries after years of the damn stuff this is the truth, catastrophic failure. And yet there are 500 million registered users on Duolingo. Now in mathematics, it's similar. And you'll know this if you've been involved in apprenticeships. You know, kids get stuck and they can go no further. You cannot do calculus without getting through a whole rack of stuff before that. You just fall off a cliff because everything thereafter makes no sense. So what you do is break down the knowledge in this fashion into individual it, this is the data as it were relationships or weightings between the objects and every student vectors through that content differently it's a bit like the sat nav in your car you know if i'm driving from uh, you know dundee to kingusi or something and i go off road then a very clear it's actually using ai uh, but the triangulation of satellites gets me back on course again and that's what you want for a subject like maths when the kid goes off course you want to get them back on course because when they get stuck they get stuck forever so bridging those little gaps, when you teach 30 kids or 100 kids in the room, there's no way you're doing the cognitive diagnosis. You haven't a clue what's going on in their heads. But the software can have a good guess. Even on something as simple as adding two double-digit numbers, there's about 12 to 13, 14 ways you can get that wrong. But you never know what all the kids are getting wrong because <laughs> you don't have the time. So using adaptive software, it's a bit like an intelligent teacher in the system, to get people through those problems, I think should be adopted whole scale. This is a Scottish company, not a single customer in Scotland. It was just been bought for cash by Cambridge University for all their courses. Which is another message, maybe. But, you know, we, I, I invested twice in this company, brought other investors in. Uh, we took it across. We got two million of Gates Foundation money. And uh, we trialled it at Arizona State University, and it was astonishing, really. You know, 50% reduction in failure rate. All those 101 courses like maths and stats and biology, introduction to biology, where all the kids are failing. And then they've got student debt, but they can't pay it off because they don't get a degree. That was the problem they were addressing there. We have different but similar problems. Another one, Duolingo. This is Louis uh, Von Ann, great hero of mine. It's an AI programmer sort of guy. Looks like it. <laughs> Uh, they, do, they do a remarkable thing. Duolingo was pretty crap at the beginning. Have a look at it now, though. You know you can speak to it, recognise it, even a Scottish accent, it'll get the pronunciation quite good and so on. And what they do is loads of A-B testing on the web. In other words, they try something, if it doesn't work, they try it again. And they've been doing this for years. And they do something super smart around practice, which is why it works cognitively. They don't concentrate on learning. They concentrate on forgetting. When you're learning a new language, and I'm sure you've all tried this, actually the problem is you just forget the damn stuff really quickly because you're not getting the opportunity to practice it. And even if you go to France or Spain, the people just speak English right back to you. So it's really difficult, difficult for our kids to learn a language. What they do is concentrate on forgetting. They have an algorithm, so in your head, they, if you're learning Russian, let's say, and it's a phrase, Kajiri Pajalsta, they will know how long it takes you to forget that phrase on past data and past performance. And for every single one of the 37 million monthly users, every single word, phrase, and grammatical rule, they know how long it's going to take to forget. And so the whole delivery system is about stopping you forgetting. It's a complete flip. Very, very clever indeed. And which is why the error rate comes down to that blue spot on the histogram here. Duolingo are now moving into mathematics, interestingly. And I'm glad to see this because I would love to see a world where mathematics, an absolute free service to help teachers and institutions for that basic stuff uh, would be available to us all for free. And it almost is. Khan Academy's been around for ages and that's free. And the last one, 
We're nearly there, folks. <laughs> the last one is assessment. Oh, 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 assessment. Other oh, kids cheating. <laughs> yeah, it always amazes me. I remember this in Wikipedia. Absolute uproar. We didn't have as much social media then. But, you know, <laughs> you, you have to laugh, really. Uh, the I, very idea that an academic institution would turn itself into a, a set of hunters hunting down students, creating a totally toxic environment, <laughs> is an educational institution at all. Really. You have to really worry about that. If that's what you're, you see this problem as being. As opposed to, let me tell you a story. So I have a degree in philosophy, went through the whole PhD thing. You know what I did in my final exams at Edinburgh University? I went to an Ivy League in the States. I memorized essays. I churned them out in the exam and I got a brilliant degree. That's what I did. That's what every student has been doing for about two or 300 years. The idea that you go into an assessment and write an essay and you apply critical thinking is absolute nonsense. Anybody who's ever, I've written four books, I've been writing all my life. I've never written anything where I don't change the order, rub things out, rephrase. The essence of critical thinking and writing is that type of act, which is why kids memorize essays and a lot of them actually cheat. Cheating is far more endemic than you might think. You know, for centuries, I mean, <laughs> I sort of moved from a sort of working class Scottish area to a very sort of posh area in England, in Brighton, you know. I was absolutely amazed when some of them, my friends were saying that they write essays for their kids at universities. <laughs> I really fell off my seat. Well, I, couldn't, I could never ask my parents to do that. <laughs> they would have regarded it as a stupid question. This is happening, folks. Parents are writing their kids' essays. Kids have been swapping essays, buying essays. Foreign students in particular have been buying. Chinese students have been using uh, paper mill, uh, essay mill things for decades. And of course, hardly any member of faculty wants to go around down that accusatory route because it, it can be painful for the staff member as well as the student. So a lot of it gets passed by. Actually, if you do, if you look at the total turnover of all those uh, essay mill companies, we know there are tens of thousands of essays. There are tens of thousands of people getting degrees who actually don't deserve that degree, if the truth be told. They probably do, but you know, that's, that's been a game for a long time. The essay is just a stupid form of assessment. Okay, in some niche areas, but by and large, it's lazy. Lecturing is easy, teaching is hard. <laughs> you know, uh, essays are easy, real assessment's quite hard. And again, there are real experts in assessment, you know, Ecom here in Scotland. I don't know anybody who's got a better assessment system. They've been doing it for years at a very, very high level. But rather than going to the experts in assessment, we get everybody to do their own assessments. <laughs> And it's a hard job if you're teaching. So an assessment, AI already identifies you digitally. Uh, you know, if you've got a smartphone and you're using your fingerprint or face recognition, iPhone or Android, that's what gets you into the system. So the ID thing's clearly very good. Wherever I go, I get my face ID going through customers. Perfect. I don't want to speak to a human being at border post. <laughs> you know, I want to put it in the machine and walk through. Uh, this is an interesting, so this is the e-com uh, company I, I was talking about here in Scotland, based in Dunfermline, in fact, and they have an AI system, they've been doing this for years. And of course, what the AI does is not just the digital checking, the authentication of the student who's meant to be doing it, because people do swap out. Uh, it also monitors people using face recognition and the environment that they're sitting in. So all that online proctoring will free assessment up from the tyranny of time and place. You'll be able to do an assessment anytime you want. I actually think an educational system should be based around that old Bloom idea, the re original research on this. It should take as long as it takes <laughs> for somebody to get to the end of a learning journey. And we're constrained by time. You know, the one hour lecture. We only have one hour lectures, by the way, because the Sumerians had a base six number system. There is no, nothing in the psychology of learning that says an hour is up, even remotely appropriate or relevant. <laughs> just because they had a 60 based number system. Of course, recording videos, you can get that, that whole randomized pictures during the, the assessment and do it quite well. And I, don't, I, th I think that's the future as well, that online assessment. This is a program that I built at the beginning of COVID. There was a massive pharmaceutical company who had to get all its scientists out of this lab and put them into the COVID labs. And it's dangerous because at that time, if you caught it, you could die. How do you solve that as a learning problem? That's a serious learning problem. Well, we used AI to build the course super quick. We did it in three days. We got the video. You have to wear two pairs of gloves when you go into a lab, if it's a safety cabinet, because if you have a tear in one, you will die. 
and we got them to watch the video, and then we asked open input questions. Right, before you go into the lab, what do you do? And you have to inspect the packaging to make sure there's no tears in it. You have to double glove, you have to put the glove over your lab coat thing. They all had to pass this exam. That was the learning experience. We then used exactly the same thing for assessment. And you really had to know this. No multiple choice questions where you can guess because the answer's on the screen anyway. I did all the assessment for BBC Bite Size in the early days because they, they had no teachers involved in the writing of the questions. And they had things like, what comes out the top of a volcano? Is it lava, magma, or chocolate? <laughs> and what do you think when you test every eight-year-old three weeks later remembers? <laughs> Multiple choice questions are terrible, terrible assessment items. And yet we're obsessed by them. And this is the way to go because the technology allows us to do it. And of course, on assessment, this chat GTB stuff can allow you to generate questions, model answers, rubrics, instruction style, all that sort of stuff is available at your fingertips now. And this is a good example of somebody who said, just typed in, this is a business plan course, and it comes up not only with the rubric and the marking, but the, the topics as well. And I think we're also moving into an area where, again, this comes back to econ, you've got all these wonderful things happening in Scotland. The, uh, these guys were using uh, VR to actually not only assess whether people could go up onto the fourth road bridge, because they hire all these people, they go up and they freak out because the train goes by and they can't cope with the train rush or the height. So they were using it to select candidates. And I was, because it's VR, you can tell whether people really do fear heights because you can simulate it, but also do the training on it as well. A wonderful thing. So we're now seeing AI orientated VR coming into the mix as well, which I think in practical learning is an important thing. So we'll come to an end and I'll leave you with this sort of word here. I, I really, I invented this crap word to be honest, but I, why not, everybody else does. But I think it has some import because we are now at an inflection point where you can't afford to ignore this stuff if you're a teacher. Pedagogy itself has to fold this into the mix because this is an event as big as the Big Bang of writing in the internet. This changes our whole relationship with knowledge and therefore we have to teach differently. I actually don't think we have to teach that differently. I think more importantly we have to recognise that people like Megan and students will be using this stuff and they will be learning differently. That's why the blended learning thing is important. Recognise that students use this stuff all the time and live with that and move on. <laughs> no, yes and, not yes but. You know, we have some wonderful things here in Scotland. I've been involved in a vested here and so on. But I don't see much example of it as using our own jewels, as it were. And I think it's time maybe that we, we took, took that more seriously. So this is a profound, I think, profound moment in human history. AI will change the way our very species exist. What it is to be human will be changed by AI. What it is to be a teacher will be changed. But more importantly, what it is to be a learner will be changed. And that's happening right now, outside of these lecture halls. Okay. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that wasn't all too much. <laughs> I hope I haven't frightened you to death. But I'll end there, and I'm more than happy to take any questions, of course. Thank you very, very much for listening. I think it would be good to ask some questions just now, maybe five sure. or ten minutes, but maybe if can we change the lights to... Yeah, it's really weird looking at darkness. can't actually darkness. see anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Sure, yeah. yeah One there. Sorry, could we just, just hold on? Is it possible the lights up? Can yeah, we thank you. swap the lights? Can't see anything. Hey. There we go. Who was there? There was a voice here. One, and then we'll come in and we'll, to, we'll sweep across. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was just amazing. So Thank you. Really lovely. Um, I just wanted to ask about um, the image you showed of AI uh, uh, now producing photos. Mm -hmm. Any artistic stuff? Because that's what I've heard before. Thank you. Uh, I'm just asking about AI for producing artistic material, such mm -hmm. as the photo that you showed us that had won prizes, like emulating human behaviour and really what comes most from our heart and our soul, like writing or photos, art. 
And I just wondered if you had any reservations about that. I mean, how in the end will we ever be able to identify what's been done by a human really uh, uh, authentically and what has been produced by AI? Yeah, good question. I'm old enough to remember a really weird event that happened in the 1970s and 80s, which is the, I can't remember what they called, the performing rights body, British performing rights body, wanted to ban synthesizers. And I'd, some of us will remember bands like the Human League and so on. <laughs> it was like a fantastic time for music, really. That was in the 80s. And they wanted to ban them on the same basis. Of course, that's stupid, isn't it? We look like, are you crazy? And of course, there are whole genres of music now, rap especially, and black music, which actually use this sampling technique all the time. And that's been the history of art. It's been the history of art to sample, to move on and do something extra with it. So I don't have any fears there. And to be honest, I think art, very adaptable. You know, you see artists already using VR, you see them using AI in very amazing ways, you know. But there's another answer to this question on the deep fake thing that worries me. So AI is so good. I'm not worried about the artistic thing. I think they'll cope with that and do wonderful things with it. What really worries me is the deep fake thing. So the first one was Obama, I don't know if you remember that video, and it looked like Obama, and he was saying hideous things. And then you have that, you, there was some really weird, there was a really good book on this, I can't remember the woman's name now, but uh, you had those sex tapes where, you know, they had the face of a famous article on porn images on video and so on. So that worries me that deep fakes can happen. Interestingly though, AI is your friend here because the reason you don't get porn on your email and all that stuff is AI is protecting you from it. And actually it, can, it spots all that stuff and filters it out anyway. So I think AI in a funny sort of way creates some problems but also solves them. But to be honest, it's, there's another really honest answer here that every technology is a double-edged sword. Now I ha actually don't drive a car. I've never driven a car in my life. But I do recognise that most people drive cars. But there's about one and a half million people die horrific deaths every year. That's like a world war of dying every year. One and a half million people get chewed up in car accidents. But we still drive cars because we recognise a utilitarian sort of balance between the benefits and the downsides. And most technologies like that. You know, and that's what we have to bear in mind here. That we have this sort of stupid utopian expectation, you know. I think we have it with people in the past, you know, I, I did a degree in philosophy at, at Edinburgh and I was really depressed when Edinburgh banned David Hume, one of the greatest intellects that Scotland has ever produced, and we cancelled the guy because we expect everybody in the past to be perfect, utopianly perfect, which is a ridiculous idea in my view. But this is also true of technology. You see it on Twitter all the time, you know, oh, look, look at this stupid, like the New York Times article, I don't know if you saw that one, you use chat GTP. And it came back and said, you should leave your wife after a long dialogue. Now, if I was in the Sloan bar last night, and this never happens in England, somebody, the guy next to me in the bar asks me, turns to me and speaks to me. You know, that never happens in England. I'm all the time here, it's great. That's why I like coming back. And he says, do you think I should leave my wife? I go, probably. <laughs> the fact that you've asked that question. And, so, and this was, well, isn't it morally terrible that this chatbot, which is just a dumb bit of mathematics, is telling him to leave his wife. The stupid overplaying of these little stupid counterexamples. But the deep fake thing does worry me. And we have to look at legislating for that. But we legislate and get through those things. Did that make sense, those answers? Uh, I, I'll, I'll try and take them in order there and I'll come back to you. There's one here and then one over here. Who was the person here afterwards? Thank you, uh, Mr. Clark, very much. It was uh, fascinating uh, listening to you. Just on your points about changes relationship with knowledge, mm -hmm. epistemology, mm -hmm. knowledge of knowledge. Yeah. There's two forms. The two external eyes of scientific observation are insufficient on their own. When that's integrated harmoniously with the greater internal insight. So I'm just also wanting to touch on the fact that we as human beings have basic fundamental, uh, you know, human capacity to think. And more than that, to think things out using our emotions. You can find God. I tell my children, my son's uh, putting up all the renewable wind energy turbines in the country just now, does all the ground engineering for them. We have a family of teachers, doctors, pharmacists, <coughs> engineers. My brother 
you may have worked with them with the Education Scotland, Mohammed Asif did the Glow platform for the country. Yeah, no. And uh, my other brother is the, the chief aeronautical engineer for the A380 Airbus for the whole of Europe. All thanks to a mother that came out of the bloody partition in the 60s. We have a creative will and a self-directed will. It's not like word processing. Well, I think, I think you're right to point to this epistemological. The epistemological issues are much wider than just two as well. You know, it's an amazingly complex area. Now, something interesting, it's a really interesting question this, because something, remember, chat GTP, the sort of AI we've had so far, is a bit like an embryo. The, the child hasn't even been born yet. Now, what's happening is chat GTP has taken the, the corpus of human text from the web. Okay, so it's all of us. It's everything we've said as a, in a culture. It's not quite actually because it's mostly English, <laughs> but, they're, but they're folding other languages in. It captures all that stuff, and when it spits out answers, it's really us that are speaking through ChatGTP in a loop. Okay, but the problem there are some problems with this software. One is provenance. Where does it come from? Like you give me an answer here, but you know how did you get that? Where does it come from? A second one is updatability. ChatGTP has only got data up to 2021. It says it in the homepage, so you have to update the thing. And it, your question was about it doesn't have common sense. It doesn't have common sense or context, okay? But the good news is that there are amazing amount of investment going in and some incredibly smart people trying to solve that problem. So, for example, chat GTP, if you ask it some simple mathematical questions, it fails because it's not technically those things called solvers. You just need to put a solver in there, like a calculator, and it solves that problem. So what you're doing is you've got chat GTP and you'll have an ensemble, ensemble of other bits of AI, like Google Scholar. Provenance, where does this knowledge come from? An interesting epistemological issue around science. Uh, updatability, how recent is that bit of knowledge? Boom. You'll find that these things will get very good very quickly on these things because that's what we're demanding of them. And remember, these companies already have it. Google already has Google. It already has Google Scholar and citations. They already own YouTube if you want a how-to type thing. So you'll see the integration of these things as we saw when the internet came along. I mean, I did a postgraduate degree at Edinburgh and spent, I must have spent six months of my life walking up and down library shelves looking for journals. I think they should take six months off every bloody PhD in the land because you can get it through Google Scholar in two or three seconds. Have we done that? No, we haven't. <laughs> Wonder why? <laughs> Funny. But the truth of the matter is these problems are going to be solved. And I don't think we should be massively critical of a technology that's embryonic. You know, it's like taking a smartphone and looking at one of those big block things when they first come out from Motorola and saying, that's a bit hopeless, look at the size of it. <laughs> and you've all got one in your pockets and you can now get chat GTP up in it and ask it any question you want. What an astounding thing. You know, I'll be in Africa. Uh, I, I go once a year to Africa. I've been there for many, many years. And the big problem they've always had is simply every single African has a smartphone. They're all $10 phones and they use them for work. It's a lifeline for people but they don't have really good internet access. Starlink, again, Elon Musk. People hate, I don't know why people hate, hate this guy so much because he said something on Twitter, I don't know. Starlink has a global network that gives internet access, 5G, which allow you to deliver this AI stuff to anybody, anywhere, no blind spots globally. If we don't think that's a good thing, <laughs> why don't you think that's a good thing? Because the people in Africa think it's a good thing and they're dying for it. You know, I've been going there for many years and the, the obstacles that we've placed. And it's free. It's free, folks, folks. Surely that's the solution. I was in Ethiopia a few years ago and the Germans had built 12 universities. And every single building, I was in the African Congress Hall in a debate there, the whole hall had been built by an army of Chinese laborers because there's not a single plumber or builder in Ethiopia. But they have hundreds of kids with degrees in sociology. It made no sense. The complete imbalance that the West has imposed through education in Africa, I think that type, uh, that's colonialism for me, when higher education suddenly increases inequalities in the world, stretches inequalities out. The graduate class take it all and think everybody should be like that. Brexit, Trump, Gilles Jean, the whole result of that came from this view. So I think this rebalancing is, sorry, I'm going, I'm going really political really fast here. <laughs> I'll slow down there. You know where I'm going with that anyway. I saw you nodding, so I presume you agree. Now, there was a chap here. Yeah, thank you. Quick. 
Anybody else got questions? I'm trying to get one in advance. Two, three down here. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, time, the one you have uh, given us all this uh, morning, and uh, hopefully uh, we will see you this afternoon even also just to uh, a general chat on... Yeah, I'll be here all day. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Uh, myself is actually quite involved in the distance and blending learning. Uh, I would say 200% because that is my role at the college here. Uh, looking to your presentation, they were quite uh, interesting. And uh, there are two parts of my question. One is uh, the slide you had your dog on. And I was quite scared because he was continuously looking to me uh, at that time. <laughs> so I said, oh my goodness, where I'm sitting, I need to actually go off, right? <laughs> He's a schnauzer. He barks at everybody. <laughs> And the second uh, part was, uh, I have three children and uh, my wife. Uh, I believe you have two children, which you have shown uh, on those slides right from the start age until 20 past. Uh, and they were full equipped with the full gadgets. Maybe they're in pockets everywhere. Uh, all the GPS were there. Uh, I know maybe it's a GDPR type of question, maybe. <laughs> uh, just wanted to know, do you have a, a partner or a wife, obviously, uh, but you never mentioned any gadgets she had any? Yeah. Uh. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, so, right, my dog, do you, I, don't know, I don't know how I'm going to respond <laughs> on the dog. <laughs> I actually, is it, is it, I got a dog when I was 62, my first ever dog. It changed my life. I was a real sceptic about getting a dog. I was one I never wanted to travel a lot. So. And then we got this dog. And I am the absolute zealot now <laughs> with this dog. You know, I love dogs. Every dog. It really sort of changed my life. You know, I, I think it gave me some empathy. I was a bit of an old Calvinist Scott, to be honest, you know. I think it changed me as a person. So the dog, you can learn from other things. A friend of mine, Frank, he's now dead. He came from Paisley. He got to the age of 40. He came from a big family in Paisley. And he never, he never got a bike when he was a kid at Christmas. And when he was 40, he phoned me up. And said, I can't, you know, what did I do here? I'm a bit embarrassed. I said, I don't really know. Go, go to the library. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. He went to the library, found a book, and it had one line in it. And it said, turn the handlebars in the direction in which the bike is falling. <laughs> what if I never thought? I, would, I said it was a joke. And he went out around the garages and off he sped in the bike. And then he went all, he, he went all the way to Syria across Turkey on his bike and so on, you know, when he was in his 40s. So you can learn amazing things. You know, I'm a big fan of adjunct or informal learning. This idea that everything should be a course, I'm, I'm not going to go back to university. This lifelong learning. The idea that universities have got any role in lifelong learning is bemusing to me. Who on earth would go back to student life when they're 40, 50? Some people would for very practical things. Blah, blah, blah. That's okay. But that really, enough's enough in the lifelong learning. Life is not a course. You know, I don't want a life course. My wife, I'm going to say something about my wife. I was in America once in a business thing, one of these sort of CEOs, and there was a, one of these American coaches. He said, oh, you have, to, you have to get a personal coach, a life coach. I was a bit puzzled. So I never thought about it. And he said, anybody here disagrees? I, put, I was the only person who put my hand up. And he said, well, why would I want a coach? He said, well, how do you know your weaknesses? And I just said, I said, I have a wife and two kids. Every, every five minutes. <laughs> Look at that. Every five minutes. Relentless. <laughs> And the guy, all the Americans were laughing, of course, you know, because they wanted to go, I didn't know, why would I want some other stranger giving me that sort of thing as well? And so my wife has all of this guy. In fact, so I'm a pretty technical person. You know, I've been involved in technology all my adult life. And I would say that my wife is much slicker than me on the street. You know, when we're doing booking.com, that's her. She's just so, she's got really, really good, all through the smartphone. And I think generally in technology, you know, I wrote a book on learning technology. It was quite interesting doing the research there because some of the great advances in technology, especially in the early part of the 20th century, was the impact it had on women. For example, we take for granted dishwashers, washing machines and so on. But I am old enough to remember the washroom. I can remember my granny having a mangle. So, you know, that in one generation, we moved from the enslavement of people in kitchens and washing and so on, to you put it in a machine and you sort of leave it. Well, it wouldn't solve the problem entirely, obviously, that would be a caricature. But technology has, we sometimes forget these massive sociological uh, uh, changes that 
the benefits, the goods, the social goods that technology brings, because we're always looking for the negative. Stephen Pinker thinks it's an inbuilt bias. We have confirmation bias, and we also have a thing called negativity bias, something that's new. We sort of automatically get a negative response to it because we're surprised and worried by it. And I think that's what happens with technology. Sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> uh, the, the second part of the uh, last question uh, is uh, a general one with regards to the uh, blending distance learning. Okay. Uh, students are actually involved in their uh, pedagogy of what we call is a learning graph. Yeah. Uh, we as a lecturer or uh, tutors provide all the facilities to the students so that they can actually achieve that ultimate goal, uh, goal to complete their course and walk away with their certificate. Yeah. I know there are always, and I'm sure uh, in the hall here, uh, everybody will appreciate there are uh, difficulties to the students who wanted to achieve their goals, obviously different resources, restrictions. Uh, what I have actually learned also that there are some uh, hidden learnings which is not directly taught mm -hmm. uh, and that comes from one of the best one which we call is Google. If you don't know, ask Google. Mm -hmm. Who is your friend? My, Google is my friend. So uh, Google, yes, uh, it's a very good uh, resource nowadays uh, compared to 50 years back. Uh, where every single learner used to read books and mm. articles, newspapers, but now everything is, is actually on a gadget. So yes, the technology is actually uh, yeah. quite good pace and it is uh, the automations uh, is coming also in uh, the shipping industry, that is what my field is actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, I appreciate you have a good time for us and uh, I have learned quite a lot of uh, uh, internal uh, Good. learning from these uh, slides and hope that everybody has the uh, share with the rest of their experience. Thank, Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Are we so short in time? Okay. Sorry, there are so many questions over here that I've never got I to. know, and I feel guilty. I'll be here all day, so just... I love that line, and I'm here all day. So those of you who <laughs> have questions, hold on to them. Uh, Donald, I, I feel you could probably talk all day and I think we could probably listen all day. For me, it's, you know, this is a true example, isn't it, of every day is a school day. I have certainly learned so much. Um, I'm, I'm Googling these things as you're popping them up, which I think we all have to embrace um, because this is changing the shape of how we live, how we learn, etc. Um, so I know that this conversation will continue throughout the day and I would absolutely encourage that. Um, one of the things, though, I will admit, this is the confession, ass assessment is of particular interest to me. <laughs> and uh, I think 15 years of a convent all-girl education, even I cheated. <laughs> and I cheated on St. Luke's chapter one of the Bible <laughs> because Sister Cyprian was cross-eyed. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally sat, that was your homework, was to learn a page and you know I would probably if you shone a light in my eye could probably regurgitate no sense or understanding of what it meant did it make me a fuller higher being did it make me question where I was in the world no but I got an A <laughs> every time and that was a great result of rote education I'm a really good learn off by heart so so in a sense I guess for me and where that has influenced what we're trying to do in the college is really shake it up change it up because if we don't you'll still continue to have the little Claire Carneys of the world who will just learn it off by heart and by some means or mechanisms manage to make something of herself but it's for all those other students who are coming through that it's not natural it's not normal you don't sit by yourself in any work environment trying to come up with the answer so we need to really question and challenge ourselves in that and Donald I really genuinely thank you for that and also giving me horrible memories of my own education. <laughs> um, so we've held some questions because we have a panel session this afternoon and I really want you to think about some 
the term I was given was provocations for this afternoon. So Donald is joining us, Megan, myself, and also um, Stephanie, who's our lead for TQFE, because I think this is really going to change how we you know, develop our academic development as well. So you know, have that in your mind. Um, but first, we're going to take a short break. Coffee is served in the atrium, where you can visit many of the stands. And I would encourage you to do so. Um, again, we also have some talented City of Glasgow College photography students showcasing their skills. So they'll be taking some pictures of folks drinking coffee and chatting. But also, if you want your own personal picture, please take advantage of it. You could all be featuring on LinkedIn this evening. Um, the list of sessions, so if you've not already pre-registered, you can do so during the break. Um, workshop locations are on the... I think they were supposed to be on the screen behind me, but they're also around about the atrium. And if you're not sure where they are, look at your um, program or the, some of the event staff will point you in the right direction. So the first session starts 11.20 till 12.10 and we've lunch in Gallery 2 where there's a little bit of a sideshow going on as well. Um, but remember, this is around about us coming together to share and learn from each other. That's what's really important. Um, and the big thing. We've got a raffle this afternoon, and we know we know that's the biggie. Sorry, Donald. <laughs> We've got the ticket already. <laughs> <laughs> the one, I've actually heard of somebody has two tickets. I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a raffle at the end of today's panel discussion. So um, good luck, enjoy your coffee, and enjoy the sessions. We'll see you this afternoon.